my name is Miriam Neptune. I want to thank all the conference organizers for having us, um, and especially Chris, Kristen Mapes, who's been in communication with us. Um, thank you for including our project. Um, I'm speaking to you from New York City, uh, Lenape Ho King, which rightfully belongs to the Lenape people. Nos Cambio La Vida, Our Lives Trans Transformed, is a website uh, which offers a digital English language edition of a book that was published in the Dominican um, Republic uh, by the Dominican human rights organization, Reconocido. This anthology contains 19 life stories by Reconocido members who are Dominicans of Haitian descent, many of whom are engaged in a struggle to have their Dominican citizenship recognized. The title, Nos Cambio, refers to the impact of the 2013 Dominican court ruling, which retroactively took away citizenship from hundreds of thousands of people born in the Dominican Republic to Haitian parents, going back four generations. Um, and my co-presenters, Ana Belique and Amarilis Estrella will talk more about that. Ana Belique made a request to the New York City-based collective, We Are All Dominican, to translate the book into English and have it distributed online so that the stories um, in the anthology could circulate to a broader audience, including people in the Haitian and Dominican diasporas. Um, this work is an important part of what We Are All Dominican seeks to do in changing the conversation about Dominicanness in, in this transnational community. As a member of WAD and director at the Barnard College Library at the time, I was able to host our first meeting at Barnard's Digital Humanities Center, um, which I thought felt like the appropriate place for something kind of experimental. Um, and because of the fortuitous support and interest of DHC staff, DHC staff um, Barnard continued to host a series of in-person and remote translation meetings there over the course of two years, starting in September 2019 and culminating in August 2021. The DHC took on the development of the digital edition as a first experiment in publishing with the flexible ed platform designed by our colleague at Columbia University, Alex Heal. Um, I was a member of the DHC staff as well, and we felt that the project embodied the principles that the center aspires to, including a Black feminist praxis of centering the creativity and an intellectual work of, of people whose narratives have been repeatedly marginalized, creating an ecologically responsible and sustainable project, and fostering a collaboration that is equitable and non-exploitative. So with my remaining time, I'll just outline a few points about our process. Um, our process uh, involved cultivating allies. Um, we were very lucky to have the support of Dr. Kayama L. Glover, who is um, the DHC's faculty director, uh, but also a Caribbean studies scholar with a long knowledge of the crisis in DR and uh, Dominican and Haitian history. Um, we also had Professor Maria Lozano in Spanish and Latin American cultures, who responded to a, an appeal for volunteer translators by giving her students credit for attending our workshops and joining the translation process herself. Um, this is a kind of blurry picture of our um, volunteer organization process um, at the beginning. Um, we were able to leverage institutional resources and distribute labor um, and in this case, we were able to pay undergraduate and graduate student associates at the DHC for playing important roles in the project, such as uploading and editing text, designing the, and testing the look and feel of the website, et cetera. Um, there was a lot of markup work and th those students got to learn a new skill um, in the process. And over the course of the project, we recruited more than four, 15 volunteers to assist in translation correction. We started with Google Translate and then um, did several layers of translation correction, after which we paid an editor. And then we did a second round of um, uh, deeper translation edits where a rotating group of repeat and one-time volunteers participated in what we call the table read process, 
And that happened over the course of several months. We basically got together every Friday to read the stories in, aloud to each other in Spanish and in English and correct the English translations through a consensus process. Um, and we tried very, very carefully to maintain and retain the voice and literary choices of each author. We also benefited from the software access and service space at Barnard, um, as well as the Zoom accounts that we, several of us had at different institutions. During the upcoming showcase, um, not during this particular time, you'll hear from my colleague, Alicia Peeker, who is the associate director of the DHC, and she managed the technical side of the project and did much of the coding herself, um, drawing on her several years of expertise with prior DH projects. So we were very lucky to work with her. I wanted to mention that um, in the final stages of the project, project, we had the support of Barnard Library. Um, and one example is the labor of colleagues like Albert Scott, who is our cataloger, and he did extensive research to describe the site as an open access resource when we were ready to publish it. Um, he placed it in, in the Columbia Library catalog, taking great care to include relevant terms that would make it findable and connect it to other um, relevant materials, uh, such as using the word statelessness. Um, I mention this work because it's the kind of contribution that often gets taken for granted, um, but it was instrumental in the formal process of publishing and giving the work institutional presence. So in, our, in my last slide, I'd just like to share a video of one of our events, uh, I mean, one of our meetings uh, with our partners. Um, we were able to prioritize um, re requesting the consent of each writer, who, all of whom were in the Dominican Republic, uh, for you know, the publication, the republication of their work and the distribution in English, um, and making sure that all the decision-making was done with guidance and consent from Ana Felique and Reconocido co-founder, who you see here, Elena Lorac. Um, our meetings with Ana and Elena resulted in important choices uh, about the website functionality and aesthetics, um, such as the decision to feature customized art for the cover page. Um, and you'll learn more about um, the work of uh, our uh, collaborator, Dominican artist and LGBTQ activist, Yaneris Gonzalez. Um, and other decisions we made, such as to connect um, people, in, rather than hosting the Spanish um, version of the text on our website, we connected it, connected people back to the Reconocido website so that they could learn more in context. I appreciated that this project represented an opportunity to take on something that was already created within the movement, um, a movement led largely by Black women who have been most impacted by anti-Blackness and targeted violence in DR, and um, to use institutional and community support to amplify it and um, give it more, more space and more breadth um, across borders, and also to build our relationship uh, with each other so that we can do more in the future. So I'm going to pass the mic now to Amarilis and Ana. Thank you, Miriam. So before I pass it over to Ana Maria and Stephanie to discuss more on the project, I'd like to just share a bit about the history and context with regards to denationalization um, practices that are rendering Dominicans of Haitian descent in the Dominican Republic stateless. So there's plenty of scholarship that highlights how the island of Haiti, the Taino indigenous name of the island, which is now referred to as Española, um, was divided through colonization into French and Spanish colonies, creating cultural divisions that continue to impact present day relationships. There's less attention though to the long history of collaboration between Haitians and Dominicans, especially in rural areas. Um, and scholars have noted that it wasn't until the Trujillo dictatorship um, in the Dominican Republic between 1930 and 1961, that we begin to see anti-Haitian ideology framed through fears of a passive invasion, um, quote unquote, passive invasion, um, which then becomes common discourse to rally Dominicans in support of the dictatorship. This leads to the 1937 massacre in which leading, um, uh, which leads to the killing of an estimated 10,000, between 10,000 and 20,000 Black Haitian migrants and Black Dominicans. Um, and while Trujillo's assassination in 1961 ended this dictatorship, su subsequent presidents and political parties um, closely aligned with Trujillo's policies continue to reproduce these racist and xenophobic um, policies. 
so slide two, if you can, Miriam. So these xenophobic and racist policies based on the concerns over Haitian migrants and their Dominican born children um, have led to progressively denying the children of Haitian migrants access to their birth certificates, as well as um, the national identification and electoral card, um, which individuals receive when they turn 18, that's often referred to as the cellula. So beginning in the 2000s, a series of laws, administrative procedures, um, led by the, the Central Electoral Board, as well as juridical rulings, are increasingly limiting the rights of Dominicans of Haitian descent to access their Dominican identity documents. Um, so on this slide, I have included a timeline of laws, administrative procedures, and rulings that progressively denationalize um, Dominicans of Haitian descent. So this timeline begins with um, the 2004 migration law that is passed and changes the definition of in transit. So until 2004, Dominicans of Haitian descent enjoyed a constitutional right to Dominican nationality through birthright citizenship. Um, if you were born on Dominican ter territory to parents who resided in the country for periods um, far in excess of 10 days, then you were legally exempt from this in-transit provision, which was usually applied to the children of diplomats or tourists um, whose children were born uh, during these visits to the country. So what this means is that from the 1950s to the 1990s, the Dominican state um, formally recognizes as citizens a significant number of Dominicans of Haitian descent. And many Haitian migrant parents were able to use their Haitian nationality documents in order to register the births of their children. Um, but with this new migration law, uh, which is uh, law 28504, um, uh, non-residents would now also be considered as in transit. So um, non-residents were broadly defined to include not only tourists and temporary foreign workers, but also persons with expired residency visas and undocumented migrant workers. Um, and in addition to regulating the entry, um, stay and employment of immigrants, the law effectively put an end to the automatic right of um, Dominican nationality that was granted to Dominicans of Haitian descent. Um, and this law was highly contested and led to a landmark judgment against the Dominican Republic by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. The ruling affirmed that these policies discriminated against Dominicans of Haitian descent and left them vulnerable to statelessness. Um, the very famous case, um, Dilcia John and Violeta Bosico versus Dominican Republic, was brought by two young girls of Haitian descent who were uh, born, were denied birth certificates, Dominican birth certificates, even though their mothers um, were born in the Dominican Republic and possessed valid cellulas. And in this judgment, the Inter-American Court found um, that the Dominican Republic was misapplying the in-transit constitutional exception. But um, what, what we're seeing is that none of this stopped the Dominican um, government and administrative officials from administ um, issuing administrative memos and procedures which continue to deny Dominicans of Haitian descent access to their identity documents. So we see administrative memos such as um, circular or circular 017, um, which um, denies copies of uh, certified copies of um, documents to anyone who's uh, suspected of having having Haitian parents. Um, and so therefore having suspect documents. And we also see another resolution, resolution 12, which um, is not labeling the parents as the suspicious factor, but instead um, is, what, is, is sort of questioning whether there were any kind of irregularities in the documents. So suffice it to say that all of these different administrative procedures um, which are, are being led by civil registry officers are, are denying documents to Dominicans of Haitian descent. And, and then quickly, just uh, before I go on to the next slide, we see that in 2010, um, there's a revised national constitution, which then um, ends the, the idea of birthright citizenship for the children of undocumented residents. But in practice, this new constitution does not dramatically change much since Dominicans of Haitian descent were already being denied Dominican nationality um, and their documents through all of these procedures and laws that I just mentioned. So this new constitution, what it really does is what all these things that were considered unlawful now become permissible. Um, 
And finally, in 2013, we see Constitutional Tribunal Ruling 168-13, also referred to as La Sentencia. And this is the, the ruling which gets um, the most international attention because it retroactively denationalizes four generations of Dominicans of Haitian descent and basically states that any individual who had been granted Dominican nationality was done so based on an administrative error. What we then see because of this international attention and these denunciations that are happening on a global scale is the creation of a law called Law 169-14, which is seen as a response to the ruling um, and is meant to restore the nationality of affected individuals, but instead continues to divide Dominicans of Haitian descent further by creating these um, groups called Group A and Group B, who are being given differential treatment based on whether or not they could prove that they had a birth certificate at some point um, uh, in their lives from the Dominican government. So in this final slide, before I pass it over to Ana Maria, um, uh, what I wanted to sh uh, just share is that as a result of these rulings, we're, we're seeing that more than four generations of Dominicans of Haitian descent have been denationalized and they're now rendered stateless. And the impact of these rulings have had detrimental effects on Dominicans of Haitian descent and dark-skinned Black Dominicans who are not of Haitian descent because they're being racially profiled by the national police and immigration officials. So in addition to the possibility of expulsion, their access to education, labor, housing, marriage, and the possibility to register the birth of their children has been limited. So it's within this context that I first met Ana Maria and conducted ethnographic research with the Reconocido movement. Um, and this is when Ana Maria expresses the need to document their own experiences um, as Dominicans of Haitian descent. And I'm so appreciative for the opportunity to be able to support this vision. So I'll pass it over to Ana Maria Belique to share more on the Reconocido movement and the development of the project. Thank you very much. My participation will be in English. On behalf of Reconocido, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak in this space and not only present this presentation as a result of a work that we have carried out, but also to connect to what has been ha taking place in the Dominican Republic to date. In the year 2010, a group of uh, youth was called by the Montalvo group, a Jesuit group, to reflect on the situation in common that we were undergoing. This is when we realized and understood that the difficulties that we had to access to our documents, identity documents, were based on a denationalization uh, policy that was carried out by the Dominican Republic state against uh, immigrant uh, children of immigrants from Haiti. And this is when the movement Reconocido comes from. A, we are a collective of youth that were born in Dominican Republic of immigrant parents that struggle for the right to be and belong. This space of the Reconocido movement became a more systematic front. And this led us to understand that we were not the only ones that were undergoing such problems of not having access to our identity cards of our birth certificate or passport. And this movement, we began to uh, meet, discuss the motivations of these racist policies and to understand that jointly we could hold a front and work together and we decided jointly to continue um, fighting for uh, the, our rights through Reconocido. Our voices, our stories, our struggles, uh, they're very, oops, uh, they, we were denied and still are denied at, in recognizing our rights uh, to citizenship uh, of Dominican Republic and to, I'm sorry, the arrival of her voice is cut up. As these sentence 161, I have put us in risk of a deportation towards IT, Haiti. We 
we had a journalistic coverage however we realize today that you are learning about this version this is like that took place as a collective of, of Dominicans of a Haitian origin we are part of on all of us on our lives it has an impact on our lives and our struggle we work from the need to be heard in 2016 and we uh, set forth this book was presented as a result of our work the workshops that we carried out we had the support of uh, a group that received us and gave us all the tools that were necessary so we could continue uh, struggling for our rights and it changed our lives it is the first exercise that we carried out in this line of work in the montalvo group we uh, had been, they had already had worked with um, Haitian and uh, Dominican group. This was our first experience as a group, taking our testimony and our stories and raising our voices towards um, and, um, talking in the first person. This process um, allowed us to cut corners and we were able to reach um, um, a value that changed our lives. I would love to say that this historical, that this uh, live stories and storytelling are linked to the authors and they still persist in our population in general. It harmonizes the different visions that have been carried out from the Dominican a people of Haitian descent, and we are in, in the face of other governing bodies. There is a structural discrimination, exclusion, the denationalization as a policy that has created in the political dominant Dominican class. With this book, we wanted to set forth our story and allows others to learn and sympathize with it. With this work, there is a great deal of people that have supported the uh, Spanish version and the English virtual version. I would like to support, I would like to thank Miriam Natun, Amirales Estrella that have always supported us and respected what we consider the best path with the support of the team and the group, the vision that they have had and the entire team, we are all Dominicans, have helped these stories and our stories to be available in English on a platform that has world access. This project, initial project, which has allowed us not only to have a website in English where each and every one of you can read and learn the stories, but also opens a possibility of materializing a new storytelling telling workshop that we have just published, a book called We Are Who We Are, Somos Quien Somos, which will be soon available in English so that you may all uh, learn about it and participate and continue supporting us to disseminate our stories. I am open to the session of the Q&A later. And thank you so much for this opportunity to share the space. Thank you, Anna. I am waiting. My camera isn't on. No sé si comenzar um, sin tener la cámara encima, pero aquí comienzo. Sí, uh, Stephanie, puedes empezar, no hay problema. Okay, perfecto. Yes, Stephanie, you may begin, no problem. Yes, perfect then community and colleagues who are participating with me today and to everyone accompanying us this evening. Hello and welcome. Once again, my name is Stephanie Holguin. 
and I'm also a member of We're All Dominican, which I will also refer to as WAD interchangeably as I present. But as Ana Maria has just finished expressing her reflections, speaking to the historical implications and the importance of this process for her and the authors of the anthology, speaking to the paramount value it has had on them as they narrated and wrote their own stories, and as she specifically addressed the embodiment of what it meant to tell their stories and then share it with the world, um, sharing it virtually in English and having it in Spanish, um, and additionally proceeding to publish a second book. So I can't help but to express what an honor it is and has been to witness their trajectory, her trajectory, Reconocido's trajectory. Therefore, aligned with this reflection, I'd also like to take a moment to highlight the importance and the impact of what translating and facilitating the launch of this anthology has had, and not only myself as a WAD member, but, as, but also as someone who has had the privilege of working on other initiatives alongside Reconocido, which for me vastly includes my own graduate thesis research on the grassrooted social movement, which I believe strategically organizes in such unique ways that provide a re-envisioning to how human rights are perceived and how activism is embodied through practice. Therein, I find it imperative for me and all who have collaborated throughout the inception of the translation process and have seen it through to its finalized published digital version to share our experiences, or at least for me to be able to express for some of those who have collaborated. As what I mentioned might slightly overlap with a little bit of what my colleagues have shared and highlighted, I'd still like to reemphasize some of the really imperative and uh, imperative details that helped shape this project, which has been almost two years, if not more, in the making, um, which, Anna, which began with Ana Maria's initial request in 2018 to translate the published book, Nos Cambio La Vida, and WAD's agreement to do so. We initiated the translating process with recruiting over 15 voluntary translators commencing the project in the fall of 2019 with an in-person translating for justice event, which my colleague Miriam Neptune has provided photos and some, uh, some similar and more details expanding on the project for earlier, uh, earlier in the presentation. However, as we continue, as we continued the translating, um, as we continue the translating sessions virtually in the spring of 2020 due to the global pandemic with the assistance of the Barnard College D Digital Humanities Center, we transitioned our session to virtual workshops where we would further explore the purpose of what, it, what transnational solidarity meant to us, including issues um, and discussing issues pertaining to COVID-19, which was and is still devastating black communities throughout the Americas and how it's um, had the particular impact on our collaborators in the Dominican Republic as well. So as I continue to share the collective importance of this project and its process, I'll also highlight that the slide presented the slide showing um, has um, the previous slide showing had um, some reflections that were added to the preface of the digital version from a few members of the WAD collective, including myself. If you get the chance to view the preface of this anthology, you will see that it has provided a beautiful space to express some of the steps, emotions, and background information that helped shape the project, such as the table read process. And thank you, Alicia, for sharing the link to the preface in the chat, as well as the link to the to the virtual digital um, publish publication. Um, so yes, so we were um, so as we initiated this kind of table read process, um, which included the volunteers the volunteers reading the original text aloud to each other, paragraph by paragraph, story by story, and word by word with a core group of members finding ourselves deeply intertwined with the lives of each person, their pains, their resilience and power, their strength to continue to organize, to advocate for themselves and the future they wanted to see for themselves. We spent long moments discussing and debating the best ways, not just to translate the Spanish language, but specifically the poetic and unique ways that Dominicans have developed their own language altogether. How does one fully ever, how does one ever fully convey a message from one tongue to the other without losing some of its nuance? How does one care for the storyteller as much as the story? What does self-care look like in the process of translating stories of hardship that may have reflect some of the translator's own life? And how much time is spent necessary to migrate a story from one language to the other? There's, those were some of the many questions that came up as we, as we translated and translators worked through the journey to bring Nos Cambio, Nos Cambio La Vida to readers in English. Essentially, the process becoming enlightening in more ways than one, 
as we came across words that were untranslatable, words that evoked a feeling so filled with depth that it could only be said and expressed in one way, in one language, and by one person at times. The words we all stumbled to capture in a single sentence and would come back to numerous times to make sure we accurately depicted what the author wanted to convey. The process taking us through all the emotions that came from gaining deeper insights into the lives of fellow Dominicans being denied the rights to live safe and full lives. As Marili and Anna both detailed the historical aspects and implications of the laws being passed. Therefore, in this next slide, um, to conclude, in reveling in this experience and what, has, and what it has been for me and my fellow collaborators. I'll share some moments captured, such as a selfie after finishing the digital book, book launch event at Barnard Digital Humanities Center and the authors located in the Dominican Republic in celebration as once we finished the book launch as well. And, um, and lastly, which I'm so proudly and gratefully able to introduce one of the authors from the anthology, Rosani Romiles Jimenez, who will be reading a selected portion of her story during our next panel. I hope that you all may join us in taking her words, her story, and also revel in the experience of listening to such transformative love and resistance. But also I'd like to importantly add that her story and all others included in this anthology are hoping to serve as windows into the experiences of people living their everyday lives under the pressures of white supremacists, heteropatriarchal, and, and as well as the power of organizing the power of resilience, love, and community, as I and my fellow colleagues have described and shared. May our insights on this translating journey bring you to explore the stories of others and amplify, and to amplify and engage with the work that, they, that has been cultivated. Thank you all, and we look forward to answering any questions that you may have, and we look forward for you joining us in our next session. Um, wishing everyone a fruitful evening, and questions, and questions are um, happily accessible.